Hi everybody and welcome to the third in our series of three videos on China that together they form our special revision webinar ahead of the 2017 A-level exams. In the first video we looked at some of the successes of the Chinese economy in recent times. In the second video we focused on some of the challenges, some of the issues, some of the risks the Chinese economy faces. And in this short video we're going to look at some of the key reforms to China which are either uh, have already started or which are planned as part of the five-year uh, five-year plan or which have been mooted in terms of trying to get China through this this key transition stage. Essentially the, the, the guiding line between reforms is the move from old China which was investment driven towards new China which is consumption driven. In our second video, we focused on the four aspects of Chinese rebalancing. They are internal, for example, shifting from investment to consumption, external, becoming less reliant on exports as a source of growth, environmental, trying to decouple their growth from the environmental impact, addressing major immediate pollution problems, and the distribution aspect of rebalancing, trying to create a more inclusive and higher quality growth which benefits people across the country. One of the uh, reforms that is often said that China needs is an improvement in their soft infrastructure. So in the last 10 years or so there's been an absolute avalanche of spending on hard infrastructure. New airports, nuclear power stations, roads, high-speed rail, new hospitals, new schools, hard infrastructure, physical capital of every type and description. Perhaps one of the key reforms is that China will move away from that hard infrastructure dependency towards softer infrastructure. What do we mean by this? Well, I, I would argue that soft infrastructure is the institutional framework that supports sustained economic and social progress. So, for example, China may well make moves limited perhaps towards opening up her markets, uh, opening some markets up to private sector competition, opening of some markets up to international competition, for example in retail. China may move towards a more progressive tax system to address income inequalities. And I'm sure there'll be reforms to their financial systems, in particular the banking and the capital markets, that more properly channels very high savings rates in China towards an efficient allocation of resources. And there may well be reforms to corporate governance, in particular improved protection of worker rights and consumers in terms of the quality of products. So soft infrastructure for China is going to be a key, a key aspect for them. The 13th five-year plan agreed in the autumn of 2015 is the current five-year plan and it's the most important one to think of in terms of the direction of travel that the Chinese economy is likely to take. There are essentially five core elements in the five-year plan with the aim of uh, China becoming a moderately well-off society by 2020. The first one is that China wants to drive the innovation agenda forward, in particular to move into higher value-added sectors and industries. A second key aspect is to improve the regional balance within China, particularly between urban and rural areas, between coastal and interior areas, and to create more regional markets, fast forward the process of urbanization, and uh, use, for example, much more of the special economic zones to drive investment. The third element of the five-year plan is environmental, to make decisive movements to develop the green economy, in particular by tackling pollution and energy efficiency. We'll come on to some examples in a second. Opening up is an attempt to increase the efficiency of Chinese domestic markets, but crucially, Chinese businesses are being encouraged to go global. I'll we'll have some examples in a few seconds of that. And the fifth one is the distribution one we mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, the aim really is to focus on the poorest 40% of households so that the benefits of development in terms of human development outcomes, per capita incomes, education, health and other metrics uh, are, are spread to the poorest 40% of households. At the moment there is a big gap in incomes in China. Living standards, for example, in rural China remain way below those in urban areas and incomes are almost three times higher in urban areas than in the interior. 
So here are some examples briefly of some of the key reforms that have been put in place or are being mooted going forward. Perhaps the best known is the end of the one-child policy in October 2015, allowing all couples to have two children. That's clearly going to have some effect over time as fertility rates change. We mentioned our second video, the HUCO system, which basically limits labour mobility in China and uh, the reforms will extend urban welfare services to some migrant workers. China has started a national rollout of VAT to be paid by businesses to try to broaden the tax base, which might then allow them to spend more money on, for example, healthcare or education. There's also a planned rise in the retirement age as a, as a response to the demographic challenge. Fundamentally, China is looking to move away from made in China, sorry, <laughs> made in China, assembled in China, to created, designed and manufactured in China. So there's a very strong emphasis in the five-year plan towards giving extra resources to targeted sectors, IT, commercial farming equipment, biopharma, robotics, and advanced aerospace and transportation equipment. China is also probably going to open the private sector up, particularly into areas such as telecoms and transport. So one or two specific examples of reform in climate change. Uh, the launch of the carbon emissions trading system is quite significant. Uh, cap and trade system introduced in 2017. The goal is to have carbon emissions peaking by 2030. Most economists argue that a cap and trade system probably won't achieve that. China may well need to move down the path of a carbon tax before then. In the energy sector, particularly with the environment in mind, the Chinese government is trying to encourage uh, more import and export quotas for independent refineries. They're trying to open up the market for liquefied natural gas. They cut the number of days that coal mines can be open last year, and that actually led to a 10% decline in coal output. Uh, and they're trying essentially to bring down the excess capacity in the energy sector and move China towards a lower carbon path of development. So renewable energies will be key to the Chinese reforms there. When it comes to urbanisation, China remains some way behind the curve in terms of urbanisation. It's probably about 55%. And high income countries typically have a much higher rate of urbanisation. But they've committed nearly $500 billion to planned infrastructure projects. In particular, they're looking to build smart cities, urban clusters. Uh, the Yangtze River Delta Urban Plan is a good example of that. In terms of financial reforms, China is moving tentatively towards a slightly more Western style banking financial sector. So they're liberalizing bank lending and deposit rates. That means that the interest rates on loans and savings are set more by the market rather than, rather than by the state. We are gradually moving towards a floating exchange rate in China. We're moving towards a sort of fixed exchange rate to manage floating, perhaps effectively a floating yuan in the next year or two. And the traditional reliance on reserve asset ratios in the banking system where Chinese banks were, for example, had to keep 17% of their deposits in cash. Uh, that's now being replaced by the use of open market operations. Chinese central bank intervening to affect the liquidity of the banking system. And crucially, a move towards more market exchange or market interest rates set by the, by the central bank. What's interesting in terms of reform in China is, that, is the growth of the private sector and in particular the emergence of um, globally scaled, globally branded uh, businesses. Here are, here are eight, Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, Xiaomi, Huawei, China Mobile, Lenovo and Dalian Wanda. I mean, these are, these are global businesses now with a global reach. Indeed, Baidu, Alibaba and Tencent are actually all listed on stock markets overseas. Um, there's some significant, significant businesses. For example, Tencent um, had 30,000 employees, mostly based in Shenzhen. Now, these are significant emerging businesses in China, and they are they have a global reach. And it's a key part of their growth and reform story. Indeed, if you look at the stock market value of some of these businesses, it really does stack up. Petro China is the biggest firm. Uh, China Mobile is one of the top 10 brands in the world at the moment. And Alibaba, one of the world's biggest retail businesses, set up by Jack Ma. One of the really key issues, one of the really key aspects to be aware of in terms of Chinese reform, is the fact that Chinese businesses are being encouraged to go global. 
China is becoming uh, less of a, of a just a mercantilist export of goods and more of an export of capital. Here are some examples recently of some Chinese overseas acquisitions. Uh, Chem China spending $10 billion to buy the Italian Pirelli tyre business. Dalian Wanda buying Legendary Entertainment and Carmike Cinemas in the United States. Um, Alibaba opening cloud data centers in Hong Kong and Silicon Valley. Just recently, Ant Financial, which is at the online payments arm of Alibaba, bought MoneyGram, a big money transfer for, for nearly a nearly billion dollars. So there are some significant examples there of Chinese outward investment. And basically what's happening here is that China is using FDI to, to buy experience, to buy know-how, technology, brands, um, to become more globally competitive in those higher value sectors. To put things in perspective, at the beginning of last year, 2016, there were more than 1,900 Chinese affiliated firms in America, employing nearly 100,000 people. Uh, now China still has control over some foreign takeovers. Some, some takeovers are not allowed. The Chinese regulators intervene. But essentially, a lot of Chinese companies being encouraged to look beyond the Chinese economy to generate returns. This is helped by the fact that China has some of the world's biggest sovereign wealth funds, including the Chinese Investment Corporation, which has a stake in businesses such as Heathrow and P&O Ferries and Madame Tussauds. So there's, there's huge sovereign wealth funds which can invest billions of dollars overseas, not just in bonds and equities, but also in big, tangible, fixed investment projects. Finally, on the reform process, I think this is perhaps the most important dynamic that you have to be aware of uh, going forward. The One Belt, One Road initiative, the so-called New Silk Road, is one of the most significant economic and geopolitical projects of the age. The stated goal of One Belt, One Road is to promote economic prosperity of the countries along the belt and road and to promote regional economic cooperation. There's a land route and there's also a sea route. One, world, one Belt, One Road passes through 60 countries across Asia, Europe and the Middle East and Africa. It's basically a series of cross-border infrastructure projects uh, such as the new China-Laos railway, building a new superhighway and motorway in Pakistan, building a, a port in Vietnam, building a deep water port in Cambodia. The new Silk Road Initiative is uh, it's started, it's happening, it will flow into Western Europe, it'll flow into Sub-Saharan Africa, it'll flow southeast of China as well. And I think this is one of the most significant reforms to be aware of in the Chinese economic model. OBOR's One Belt One Road's main purpose, I think, is really to develop industrial capacity and consumer demand in countries outside of China. Okay, so rather than extracting raw materials, China is basically seeking to shift its, its heavy industry to less developed countries, therefore making them richer in terms of per capita income and thereby encouraging increased demand for Chinese products. So the key reforms to China are really all about developing internal markets, developing the cities in the regions and the interior, increasing the capacity and capability of the economy, addressing environmental issues, addressing distributional consequences of, of rapid growth, but essentially fundamentally to build trade and investment networks which will sustain China's emerging higher value added sectors in the years to come. That I think is the essence of the Chinese reform agenda at the moment. They will use their own model to do it. They don't have to rely on, on a, on a off-the-shelf economic model for other countries. This is a fascinating country to watch. There's something of interest for economists and students of China every single day. And I hope that our series of short webinars on this topic has whetted your appetite and you'll check out more of our videos on the YouTube channel. Thank you.